Buongiorno, my students. Today, uh, I am going to talk to you about the Renaissance. Buongiorno means good day in Italian, and I am saying that to you because the Renaissance begins in Italy, which was also incidentally the place where I was born. I was born in Vicenza, and so Italy has a lot of um, special significance for me, and uh, although the Renaissance began in Italy. It spread across Europe in different ways and even spread a bit into the United States during the early colonial period. Um, although, as I said, it has different permutations. There have also been um, discussions about whether or not the Renaissance was really the Renaissance. Was it really a thing? Uh, and there's actually a, a very funny video on YouTube of uh, John Green in um, Crash Course World History saying, you know, it's not like they walked out one morning and said, hey, Luigi, come on outside. It's the Renaissance. Um, no, that didn't happen. Um, but what did happen was there was a confluence of an interest in um, early Greek and Roman texts, a lot of things were being built during the Renaissance, and so they were uncovering a lot of Greco-Roman ruins in uh, Italy uh, and in Rome in particular, although the Renaissance technically began in Florence. Um, but these things um, all led to an interest in a philosophy known as humanism, which if you're taking philosophy right now, you may have talked about. Uh, and that in turn led to some other developments. So let's begin looking at a few images and talking about things. Now, I am going to put this up on D2L. It's not going to have... Um, what I will do is I'll have this film up on D2L, and then I will also post the slideshow without my commentary. So if you wish, you can read it on your own. Um, so in any case, what's very interesting about this period of time is that Italy was not Italy as we know it today. Italy was divided up into different kingdoms, as you can kind of see around here. There's the kingdom of Padua, the kingdom known as the Veneto, which was Venice. Um, there's Milan, there's Savoy, there's Genoa, there's Florence, there's Tuscany, there's Naples, which is actually where my family is from, the kingdom of the two Sicilies, which includes the island of Sicily and Naples. Uh, and Sardinia was actually owned by Spain, and Corsica um, has been owned by France and by Genoa. Uh, Naples has also been occupied by uh, France in different times. It's very confusing, and I won't get into it all right now. But basically what I'm going to talk about is the beginning of the Renaissance and how it affected Europe, how it affected Italy. And we're going to start in what is known as the Quattrocento, or the 1400s. So for the most part of that century, the city of Florence in Tuscany was the intellectual, financial, and artistic center of the Renaissance. And there was a poet named Plutarch. He was a 14th century poet, and he wrote about humanism and also studying those uh, classical texts. If you'll recall, when we use the word classical uh, in the context of art history, we're we're usually talking about things that go back to ancient Greece and ancient Rome. So uh, 15th century writers such as Leonardo Bruni um, extolled Florence as the new Athens and the heir of ancient Roman republicanism. Um, there was some interest in trying to revive democracy, kind of, sort of, still rule by the rich, but um, there was kind of an interest in it. And there was a chair of Greek studies appointed at the University of of Florence in the 1390s, and so um, within the next few decades, they were translating people like Plato and Aristotle and um, all the other Greek authors. So there's a new interest in humanism and in looking back at these classical texts. And with that, also classical art. So the Renaissance is often called the Great Age of Humanism because it revived um, ideals that are embodied in the ancient Greek axiom, man is the measure of all things. So there's a shift from uh, the sacred to the secular, even though the Catholic Church is still kind of ru running everything and art 
is mostly patronized by the church, we're starting to see much more of a secular viewpoint emerging. So Renaissance humanism flourished from around 1300 to 1600. As I said, it was many faceted. They're moving away from medieval thought and moving mostly into Aristotelian logic uh, and also with uh, the Petrarch in the 14th century. There are educational reforms that are approaching classical studies independently rather than trying to link them with Christianity, although there's still an attempt to do that. Um, Neoplatonic philosophy is basically uh, in the Renaissance, the revival of the ideas of Plato, but trying to um, resolve them with Christian belief. So in any case, they're also, as they are, as I said, there was a lot of building going on, and as they were building things, they're uncovering things. So there is a fledgling interest in archaeology beginning as well. And what you're looking at here is a portion of a painting of the Medici, and what we will see throughout the Renaissance is how patrons of great art are often painted right into the art. So the Medici were the dominant Florentine baking in the 15th century. They were the de facto rulers of Florence due to their great funds, and they were great supporters of humanism. So they um, gave money to people who were studying Plato and Neoplatonism, and they also were collecting Greek and Roman sculpture, and they were giving contemporary artists access to it. They also supported a lot of the Renaissance artists, uh, and they also understood the power of imagery, and they used it to extend their own fame and influence beyond the border of their own states, often by uh, having their portraits painted is one way, and also by having themselves included in uh, paintings of works that they were supporting. So, um, courts throughout Italy were thriving uh, centers of artistic uh, activity. We'll say that. What's also interesting is girls are also being taught together with boys, and women learned both Greek and Latin as well as other humanist subjects. And so what was interesting is, and what you need to know, is that by the time students were becoming part of the courts themselves, they would already be skilled in politics, diplomacy, rhetoric, they would already know the classics, and husbands would often go away fighting as um, condottieri, meaning soldiers of fortune, who, um, that will become important later, soldiers of fortune, um, or sometimes they might be engaged in diplomatic uh, missions abroad, so the women could run the home front, basically, while the men were away. So let us move on. So artists gain stature as they absorb the culture of classical um, antiquity. And the person that we're looking at here is Lorenzo Ghiberti. He was a goldsmith. And around 1450, he wrote something called the Commentari. And that basically combined art theory with history, biography, and autobiography. And Ghiberti himself had not received a formal humanist education, but he felt that it was uh, a foundation for artistic training. And he's important to know uh, as one of the great artists of the early Renaissance. And this is his self-portrait, which will pop up again later. Uh, and so a lot of artists went to Rome um, in order to look at the ancient works of art, to look at the statuary, to understand uh, how they um, created things, how the architecture was put together. Um, and uh, basically all of this contributed to um, the greater knowledge that artists would bring back to their courts and to the works of art that they themselves produced. And in the second half of the 15th century, we have Leonardo da Vinci. And what you're looking at here is uh, a page from one of his sketchbooks. He left behind many, many, many sketchbooks. And one of the things that he did is, aside from being an artist, he was like a triple threat. Uh, he was an architect. He was a painter. He was a scientist with a very keen mind. And he was... Um, probably the first person to dissect the human body and produce the first detailed anatomical drawings that we had had since antiquity. Uh, at this time, we also have the invention of printing and the use of movable type, which I'll talk about a little bit later in this course, which is also very important. We also have what's known as the 
so-called age of discovery um, with, you know, Christopher Columbus sailing off to America in ships that were owned by the Medici uh, and that heralded this great age of world exploration in the 16th century. And when I say discovered, those lands already uh, existed. They weren't like suddenly poof, they're there because he discovered them. Hmm. So the other thing that's interesting about the Renaissance, if you haven't already guessed it, is that it has a very interdisciplinary nature. Uh, artists in the Renaissance were often not just painters, not just sculptors, but they could also be architects. Uh, and they would apply these things to the things that they created. And what you're looking at here is a very important dome, which is one of the first domes to be created since Greco-Roman antiquity. And I will be talking about this as we move on. Uh, so this is Leonardo Bruni, very important guy, but to the Renaissance, but I'm going to move ahead because I want to try to keep this a little bit shorter to keep your attention. And as I said, if you want to read more about him, um, the slideshow will be up on D2L. I want to kind of get to the nitty gritty of the Renaissance. This is all his sarcophagus, which yes, it's magnificent, um, but let's move ahead. I will tell you a couple of important uh, architectural terms that we will be looking at. So whenever you see those little cherubs, right, there's cherubs, tons and tons of little cherubs in um, Italian Renaissance art. They don't call them cherubs, they call them putti. So there's the word putti. When you see the little baby angels, they are putti. And a lunette is basically a half moon shape, such as you see here. And then here, a tondo is a... Um, basically a round form that has a picture in it. So there's those terms that you should know. And we're going to move ahead. So what is something that causes um, kind of a great thing within the Renaissance? Um, competition was very fierce in the Renaissance amongst artists for uh, receiving commissions. And the bulk of the works being commissioned were from the church. And so in Florence, they had in 1401 a competition to design the Florence Baptistry doors. And we don't really know a lot about all the artists who competed in this, but we do know about two. Uh, and the two of them were um, like the last two, they were the, you know, when we get to the final night of American Idol and you've got the two, you know, the last two singers, kind of like that. Um, but here they are going to, um, they're commissioned to design gilded bronze reliefs illustrating Old and New Testament scenes uh, on a pair of doors for the Florence Baptistry. So the subject that was chosen for the competition was the sacrifice of Isaac, which if you're not familiar with that story, the story is that um, Isaac was um, the son of Abraham and Abraham um, was being tested by God. And the way God tested him was to say, please kill your only son as an act of faith. Well, imagine, you know, the hysteria that that probably brought on Abraham. Um, so Abraham's like, well, if I if I have to, I guess I gotta. And as he was about to kill Isaac, an angel intervened, and having proved his obedience to God, he was instructed to sacrifice a ram for Isaac. So Old Testament story, Old Testament stories tend to be, you know, a lot more harsh than the New Testament stories. So we'll move on. So we have the two um, pieces that were the um, <clears throat> contestants. So one is um, two young artists, or the two are two young artists in their 20s, uh, one named Filippo Brunelleschi and the other named Lorenzo Ghiberti. And Ghiberti won the competition. Um, and his, um, so his is on at the right, Brunelleschi's is on the left. And if you look at them for a moment, you know, you may decide which one you like better or less. Um, we're not really sure why um, Ghiberti's was chosen as the winner. We just know that it was. Um, we're going to talk about each of them. The important thing to know is at this moment, Brunelleschi says, well, I'm done with sculpture. I'm going to become an architect at this point on. And um, Brunelleschi actually did leave sculpture, but he contributed something much, much more important than um, 
a door on a church, although this is an important door on a church. Um, basically, um, what Brunelleschi did is he went on and he created linear perspective. So he moved for a few years to Rome and he studied, studied ancient buildings and monuments there. And um, Vasari, who was a writer of the Renaissance, he wrote about the artists' lives. Uh, he said Brunelleschi was um, inspired to study the architecture of antiquity, taking um, proportions into note and carefully following classical rules of architectural proportions and somehow with all of that he came up with the mathematical scheme that would become linear perspective which goes on to influence the rest of the Renaissance so we cannot minimize his contribution um, the other thing that when he came back to Florence that he did is he was um, the first to build um, a successful dome, um, the biggest dome since antiquity. So they had built domes in antiquity on buildings like um, the Pantheon in Rome, which is a building that has a very large um, dome on it. The problem with building a large dome is that you need to be able to support the weight of all those bricks, you know, all the way from the bottom to the top without them caving in. And somehow, um, you know, between um, the uh, classical age and the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, they had lost the technology. So by studying in Rome, Brunelleschi starts to figure out, well, here's how we can do it. And so he constructs a dome for the same cathedral um, that he had lost the competition for the doors. Of. Um, so basically what he did is he set the dome on an octagonal drum and they wanted him to create uh, a dome to surmount this drum, which was already in place, measuring 138 feet across. So how was he going to do that um, mechanically? and still create something aesthetically pleasing. So basically here we have, this is the um, the Pantheon as I mentioned before. This was a dome 142 feet in diameter and you will notice that here the drum, um, or not the drum, the, the dome is not really a perfect dome. It's a little bit more egg shaped. Okay, we'll give them that. Um, where here the dome is a lot rounder, but the difference is there was uh, a hole at the top of uh, the, the Pantheon called an oculus and that that maybe is part of what made it um, able to span the opening. Um, but the Florence Cathedral itself didn't lend itself to Roman building techniques. So the octagonal drum was too weak to support a heavy dome and it was too wide to be built with um, the wooden centering, the wooden framework that they would have used in the Middle Ages. So he had to solve this issue and he did in 1417. So basically Basically what he did is he followed a horizontal construction plan that was based on a system of vertical ribs. As you can see here, these are the ribs with primary ribs and they were placed at each of the points of the octagonal drum. And then at their base, they were approximately 11 feet by 7 feet, and then they taper up towards the apex, and those ribs would be viewable, um, visible to the viewer from the outside, and then between those ribs would be secondary ribs, which you would not see from the outside. So there's a total all the way around of 24 ribs, and then around those he constructed in horizontal sections two shells to comprise uh, a single dome and then connected by horizontal tiers, ties placed at intervals as you see here. So by building two thin shells instead of one uh, single thicker one that lessened the weight of the dome and the thrust was further reduced by building it at a steep angle. So it's pointed, as I said, it's a little more egg shaped rather than a per a perfect hemisphere. But this is the first dome that we have since uh, Greco-Roman antiquity. So that's a significant thing. 
and he worked on the dome for 18 years and uh, that's not the only thing that he did you know like uh, any person working in construction any contractor he's got to have other projects so uh, he worked on the uh, Ospedale degli Innocenti or the Hospital of the Innocents in Florence which was commissioned in 1419 by the Silk Guild to shelter orphans and foundlings and I'm not going to talk a lot about it um, just to mention that uh, oh yeah the Medici financed this that you know rich banking family once again and um, it's another important Renaissance building that you can read more about on your own so there you go and now we're going to look at another Brunelleschi church again I'm not going to talk a whole lot about it except to say that he really simplified church design um, this is Santo Spirito um, which is different from the Gothic churches that had come before it's very simple there's beautiful um, circles and you know curves to the outside of the church the outside is very plain which is different from the um what you call it from the, <laughs> the gothic period and this is the inside of the church and again i will let you read more about that on your own and the style is also in the plan is what's known as a latin cross which is basically means when you look at the floor plan of the church which you see here it looks like a cross and this up here is where the baptistry would go where people would be baptized and the main altar would also be around there as well so we'll look for a moment at Ghiberti's doors for the baptistry because in this particular um, section of the door you remember it was supposed to be divided up of images from um, the Old Testament and the New Testament and um, what we see here is Ghiberti is benefiting from Brunelleschi's creation of or discovery of linear perspective. So this is um, the meeting of Solomon and Sheba on the east door of the Florence Baptistry. And Solomon and Sheba actually has political as well as Christian implications because it's trying to show um, a pairing of Old and New Testament events and personages um, to include um, contemporary politics. So basically the unification of East and West, Sheba meets Solomon. And so um, what we have with linear perspective is the idea that things that are in front are larger than things that are in the back for one thing. So if you look at just this um, architectural creation uh, that uh, Ghiberti has put in here, you can see that in, things recede in size as they go down to what's known as a vanishing point, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Another thing he did to create the illusion of greater space is all these people who are in the front of the image protrude from the image more. The um, It's higher relief uh, than things that are in the distance, which are flatter relief. So it's trying to create the illusion of fully three-dimensional space. And uh, again, you can read this on your own. What I'm actually going to do is give you guys an assignment where you're going to choose something from this chapter to write a one-page paper about. So uh, I'm going to let y'all do your research on your own and look through this slideshow and decide what looks interesting to you. So uh, again, you can see this is um, the creation of Adam and Eve. And once again, um, Ghiberti is creating an illusion of depth by, again, things that are in the front. Here we have God creating uh, Adam, and that protrudes more from the space. And then back here, we have the creation of Eve. She does not protrude as much. And then even going farther back into the sky, things are much flatter. And then before leaving here, we see how um, Ghiberti plays, um, gives tribute to himself, plays tribute to, to himself by putting his face on the cathedral. And it's interesting, he's using the circular form that his very bald head is echoing. So maybe he, he would be looking out, maybe saying something about, um, yeah, I won against Brunelleschi, even though Brunelleschi created the dome. Check me out. I don't know. 
So here's a better explanation of linear perspective. And um, prior to this um, discovery, I guess you could say, um, artists would use oblique views of architecture and natural settings to create that illusion of spatial recession. Well, what does that mean, oblique view? Well, it means they eyeballed it and did their best at reproducing what they saw. With linear perspective, you have a mathematical way of accurately capturing recession into space. So um, there's a couple of vocab words in here, one of which is the horizon line, which is across the, um, the picture. This is an example of one point perspective, which I will talk about this picture uh, in more detail later. It's a very important Renaissance picture. Um, but at this point, we'll say the horizon line would be roughly like if you were standing in the middle, that's the point at which the horizon, you know, goes off into the distance. And that's what the vanishing point is in one point perspective. So you have one point perspective here. So that's the vanishing point. And then you can draw orthogonal lines. Those are diagonal lines that are drawn to accurately capture architectural details. So so that you can see the tiles line up uh, if you draw lines on either side of them to go back to the vanishing point. All of the architectural details line up using orthogonals to go back to that vanishing point. Each one of these uh, little um, shapes would have been drawn using uh, orthogonals to do that. And here's a, a drawing that shows the idea even more clearly. So again, it's the idea, the observed fact that distant objects seem smaller than closer ones and that the far edges of uni uniformly shaped objects appear shorter than the nearer edges. So this is a, a great example of a linear perspective drawing. And Brunelleschi conceived of the picture plane, uh, the surface of a painting or relief sculpture, as a window. Okay, so you've got your window here, and then the frame of the painting is the window frame. And then few, through the window, the viewer sees the depicted scene. So the edges of architectural objects like roofs and walls would be extended along those imaginary lines known as orthogonals to converge at a single point the vanishing point. So there's another much more basic drawing giving you uh, an idea of how that works. So the paintings of Piero della Francesca are notable because he really um, stuck very strongly to this idea of um, linear perspective. And this is called the flagellation of Christ, which this is where uh, in the Bible you have Pontius Pilate all the way back here and you know he orders Christ to be whipped so Christ is tied to this column here and what's interesting to me about this picture is uh, that Piero della Francesca is so interested in showing off his ability to paint using linear perspective that the subject matter of the painting is off in the distance um, rather than you know everything else. And what is interesting is actually um, from looking at this painting, he's drawn, painted it so exactly that you could actually reconstruct a floor plan from this. So it's pretty amazing in that way. So, um, and it would require meticulous planning and very detailed perspective studies. And in addition to Piero della Francesco, a lot of artists would use linear perspective and make preliminary studies uh, in the planning stages of their work. So here we have again another page from Leonardo da Vinci's sketchbook. This is his plan uh, for the Adoration of the Magi. And you can see the many, many lines that he drew in um, trying to lay out the schematic form of the painting and trying to get all the linear perspective just right. And uh, Paolo Uccello in particular loved solving um, issues of creating and the illusion of nature on a flat surface. And uh, this chalice is often shown as an example um, of that it is supposed to be like a Renaissance chalice. And he's using all kinds of geometric shapes, mainly trapezoids, to create the illusion of a spinning, uh, of spinning motion in a rounded transparent object. And this looks, you know, like something that could have been drawn on a computer, but it was not. It was drawn by a human being, um, probably 
staying up very late into the night, you know, trying to get all those little lines in drawn just perfectly. Sixty years later, we have Andrea Mantegna uh, using perspectival theory to create what we call radical foreshortening. This is the dead Christ. So he is placing the viewer at the base of Christ's feet, the way it would look if we were kneeling, not at his side, but at his feet, and the way that the optical illusion that's created um, in uh, two-dimensional space to try to make it feel like something three-dimensional uh, and to make it seem as though uh, Christ's form is receding in space. This is radical foreshortening where you've got, you know, the feet. We can fully see um, the bottoms of his feet pierced by, you know, the, uh, the nails for the crucifixion and his hands, but his legs look really truncated and so do his arms and his torso, um, everything going up to his face because uh, the actual vanishing point is off the picture frame. I can't even make my cursor go above it. Um, it's all the way up there. <laughs> so again, mastering linear perspective. So I'm going to move ahead from this. Again, this is something you can talk to if you wish. Um, but we're going to look at another painting utilizing, once again, linear perspective, and that is Masaccio. And this is Masaccio's Holy Trinity in the Church of Santa Maria Novella in Florence. And it's using not only the new perspective uh, system, but also new architectural forms that were established by Brunelleschi. So this is a diagram of the picture. We'll look at the actual thing in a moment. Um, he felt that the viewer would be standing right here, and so we would be looking up at Christ. So this is where the vanishing point is here. And this is what's known as a barrel vaulted ceiling, where basically it's a series of, it's a tunnel, they call it a barrel vault, and he is showing the um, the vaults within the vault, as it were, that's what these little squares are called, um, or coffered, actually, coffers. And um, he's, again, trying to create the illusion of three-dimensional space. And supposedly, when he painted this, people were so knocked out by its realism that it, it challenged them. It made them feel like they were looking at an actual art. Uh, architectural construction within the church and of Jesus being crucified on the cross. So now let's look at the actual thing. So uh, this is heavy with a lot of uh, Renaissance uh, imagery. So what's going on here? We're going to break it down. So down at the bottom, we've got a skeleton laying on a tomb, which has been painted in very great architectural detail and lots of light and dark value to make it look as though it is... Um, actually three-dimensional, and there's a skeleton laying on top of it, and there is uh, an inscription above it that is in Latin, but basically translated into English is, I was once what you are, and what I am you two will be, and what that means is that he, um, it's a reminder of death. Uh, we're all going to die, and one of the things that, you know, was of great pain and, you know, something that was on everybody's mind in the Renaissance is people often died young. And uh, also there were uh, at various times throughout the Renaissance plagues, the bubonic plague um, spreading through Europe killing off entire villages. So people were very aware of their own mortality. And so uh, this was something in the Renaissance that was a reminder that, you know, you want to mind your P's and Q's because if you do, you'll go to heaven. So that's one of the things. Remind that their time on earth is limited and that if you believe in Jesus and you lead a good life, you will have eternal salvation. So then the other thing we have, so here's Jesus. We've got the Holy Trinity. We have Jesus. Jesus, we have God, and very hard to see, but way up here, there's actually a dove representing the Holy Spirit. So you have the Holy Trinity, and then on one side, we have um, Jesus' mother Mary, and on the other, we have St. John, and they're both expressing their grief. And then on, who are these people on either side? Well, those people on either side, I think actually I do a breakdown. Yeah, here they are. Those people, they are members of the Lindsay family, and they're the ones that actually commissioned the whole painting. So uh, 
um, again, another um, thing showing you how um, patrons were immortalized in works. And a lot of times people believed that if they donated money to church, they would be able to go straight to heaven rather than having to spend time in a place called purgatory, which is kind of a... Um, a a waiting room, if you will, between this world and heaven um, while they figure out, you know, your sins and so forth, and if you are worthy of getting into heaven. So they believed that by spending money in this fashion, they would spend no time or at least less time in purgatory. Uh, so next we're going to look at the Brancacci Chapel, which was a major commission, and um, he uses a thing called chiaroscuro, which comes from the Italian words chiaro, meaning light, and scuro, meaning dark. And basically what that means is um, the artist is using light and shade more so than line to, again, create the um, illusion of mass and volume and form. And they love playing around with things like the drapery of cl um, people's clothing, which you can see here. Um, up here, there's a couple things you can talk about any one of these separately. This is the um, expulsion from Eden. This is um, St. Peter uh, and kind of a whole story that goes on in the Bible, which I will talk about. Um, so let's go on. So here is um, Masaccio's Adam and Eve in the scene of the expulsion from the Garden of Eden. And these are uh, important things to know because these are the two most powerful painted nudes since antiquity. So Eve's pose is derived from ancient sculptures of Venus um, that Masaccio would have seen in the Medici collection. And um, Eve is, you know, modest at this point. She and Adam have discovered, oh my gosh, we're naked. So she's covering herself as they're being cast out of um, Eden by the angry angel up here, whose arm and is foreshortened, by the way. And then we have Adam covering his face in shame. And then here, this is a very interesting painting because it's actually showing several scenes of the same story. This is tribute money. And basically what it's showing us is where Christ goes in and says, render to Caesar, you know, what is owed to Caesar. And St. Uh, Peter goes off and, you know, pays the taxes. And how does that happen? Well, I'm going to show you. Um, but the one thing I will show you here is something called isocephaly, where they make all the figures of um, basically the same height, trying to create unity in the picture. So we're going to break it down. You got St. Peter over here. You've got Jesus here. You've got St. Peter again. And then you've got St. Peter again over here. So here we go. Oh, also, backs of people. Well, um, in the Renaissance, people turn and twist in space, whereas during Goth the Gothic period, everybody's frontal. So here's St. Peter, and um, Jesus has no money with which to pay tax at the temple. So he tells St. Peter, go to the Sea of Galilee. You're going to find money in the mouth of a fish. And that's Jesus's hand pointing at Peter. And Peter's like, uh, pfft, no way um, is that going to happen. But he goes off because, you know, Jesus is the boss. And he goes to the Sea of Galilee. And oh, look, there's a, a coin in the mouth of a fish. So over here, framed by this arch, um, Peter is paying the tax collector. So you've got the greatest point of dramatic conflict between Jesus and Peter at the center. Uh, so that's kind of like the climax of the story. And then you've got the denouement, if you will, and the resolution over on either side kind of interesting. And then Masaccio has also used something called aerial um, and, or atmospheric perspective, which is where things that are going off into the distance have a more um, bluish face to them. They look a little bit more blurred and they're a bit more bluish. Um, and this is something that Renaissance artists used a lot in their backgrounds to show the distance of things. So even though the Renaissance is doing all this great stuff, um, 
in other parts of Italy and other parts of Europe, they're still painting in what's known as the international Gothic style. Uh, and although there's still a few things, like here we actually have the back of Joseph, so you could argue there is some Renaissance influence here. Um, this is uh, Fabriano Gentili's work, The Adoration of the Magi. I'm going to let you guys read about this on your own, though. Um, again, so that if you wish, you can... Uh, write about it, it for your assignment. So next we're going to come to Donatello. He was not a mutant ninja turtle. He was a great Renaissance sculptor. And he outlived Masaccio by nearly 40 years, and he developed his style well into the next generation of uh, Renaissance artists. And we're going to look at his marble statue of St. Mark here for just a moment um, and just note the realism of it, um, that there are veins in uh, Mark's hand. The folds of his robe are very realistic. Uh, and these are things that distinguish the art of the Renaissance from the art of the Middle Ages. But what we're going to look at more specifically is three Davids. David was uh, a symbol for the city of Lawrence. If you know the story, story of David and Goliath, uh, then you might understand the idea of the little guy going up against the giant. That's how Florence saw itself against its city, um, its sister city-states in Italy, uh, as they were the little guy. And um, if you don't know the story of David and Goliath, basically David in the Bible, um, there's this giant who is threatening his people and they're trying to figure out what to do. And David is just a boy and he takes his um, a slingshot and he knocks out the giant and then cuts off his head, which is the idea that even a little guy can make a big difference. And that's you know, what Florence thought of itself. But what I want you to notice here is look at this particular David. He's in bronze, um, and this, it's a pose at rest. He's already knocked out the giant and severed his head, and he's got the stone in his hand that he's presumably retrieved from the one that hit the head of the giant, and he's just kind of going, heh, I've done this. Uh, and what you'll notice, he is naked. Again, uh, this is the idea that um, man is the measure of all things. The most beautiful form is the nude human form. So that's why a lot of these sculptures are of nudes. Um, but as I said, he's looking down and it's a moment of rest. He's pausing. You'll notice he's very fleshy. He's very boy-like. You know, he looks you know, like he doesn't work out or anything like that. He's just a young, unformed, undeveloped boy at this point. Uh, and he is standing over the giant. Also, it's um, a Christian type for Jesus and Satan. Again, they're always trying to reconcile the Old Testament with the New Testament. So David's victory over Goliath is like the triumph of Jesus over the devil. So I'm going to kind of move ahead really fast because I want to look at a different um, David, actually several different Davids. So the theme of David and Goliath is very important in the Renaissance. And so this is the youthful David of Castaño, which is actually painted on a leather shield. Now, this is a beautiful shield. You probably would not carry a shield like this into battle. You would be using it um, probably for ceremonies and things. And it it's sort of combining um, times because it's showing um, David is holding his slingshot with the stone in it, and he also has the giant's head at his feet. There is some movement in this. He's also clothed. Um, so in any case, so that's that Goliath or David. Now we're going to look at Verrocchio's David. Verrocchio, by the way, was the teacher of Leonardo da Vinci, and I'm going to be getting into da Vinci um, soon, but he's not quite figuring into things quite yet, but he will. So um, what you see here, again, we have uh, a clothed uh David, uh, again at rest, but the figure is a little bit more open because you've got the, the sword down here, his uh, elbow jutting out. Uh, again, he's he's a bit more scrappy too. You know, he's more sinewy. He's gazing out at space. He's not looking down at his victim going, heh, heh, heh. So it's a different kind of um, adolescent arrogance as the slide says. So that is another David. And I'm going to show you yet 
at another one. I hope I have it in this chapter, otherwise I'm going to feel super stupid. Oh, dear me. Okay. Da, 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 da. All right. I may be stupid. Okay. We're going to bop out of this for a minute, and I'm going to show you online another David. Isn't this fun? It's almost like being in class with me. Oh, look, there's my Facebook page. Okay. Ignore my Facebook page. We're going to go to um, Google and go to Google Images, and we're going to bring up Michelangelo's David. There we go. And what I want to show you um, with this David, let's see if we can get him nice and big. Um, he is nude. Um, okay, well, that's not too bad. He's nude, you know, like um, Donatello's David. But what you'll notice is he's much more masculine. He's not really effeminate here. Uh, and he's also much more well-developed. Um, you can actually see veins in his hands. You can see the musculature of his torso. He's much more um, developed. And this is showing you how uh, in the Renaissance, the art is getting much more realistic with time. And with that, I want to show you yet another David. So we're going to show you... Um, this is actually going into a later time from the da uh, this David. This is um, Bernini's David. Here we go. So Bernini's David is even more different than all of... Actually, let's look at it this way. Because this one you want to see from all different angles. And the reason for that is this David has a ton of movement going on. There it is. Um, you can watch the YouTube thing later if you want. Um, you can see him um, moving. He is in the act of actually, oh, and here, there's Donatello's, there's Michelangelo's. You can actually see that he is in the act of slaying the giant. Um, all the other sculptures at this moment, um, at this point in time in the Renaissance are showing you um, either before or after. They're not showing you during. And so there's a great sense of energy and a great sense of movement going on in Bernini's David that you don't see in the Renaissance um, Davids. And that's because this is going into the Baroque period, which we're going to talk about later. Uh, now, I know I skipped ahead of a lot of things, but I'm going to conclude this slideshow here because um, I, I think that some of my slideshows have been a bit too long. So I want you to kind of digest all of this. And then uh, tomorrow I'm going to publish what the assignment is. And as I said, I'm going to put up uh, the full slideshow and a full list of vocabulary words also, um, either later today or tomorrow.